Mundy earned his BA and MBA from Bowling Green State University and his PhD in Business Administration from Pennsylvania State University. He is currently the John Barringer Professor of Transportation Studies and Director of the Center for Transportation Studies at the University of Missouri-St. Louis, where he teaches courses in supply chain management and transportation. He is the author of numerous industry reports and an active lecturer at national transportation and logistics seminars and a frequent contributor of articles to trade publications and journals. Dr. Mundy sits on the editorial boards of the International Journal of Transportation Planning and Technology and the Transportation Management Journal, and is a consultant to both public and private sectors, including engagements with numerous U.S. airports and their ground transportation companies, the U.S. Department of Transportation, World Bank, Burlington Northern, and Cola Company, to name just a few. He is also the executive director of the Airport Ground Transportation Association and director of the Tennessee Transportation and Logistics Foundation. And we are pleased to have him here with us tonight to talk about the disruptive history of vehicles for hire. Won't you please join me in welcoming Dr. Raymond? everyone turning out tonight in such a beautiful evening out there. So I very much appreciate uh, you coming in to listen to uh, really something that was a journey for me um, in doing a history uh, research. And I'll explain why in just a minute as soon as I get my, my clicker up here. Uh-oh, that's the wrong way. Let's see if I can get it this way. There we go. Uh, I wanted to explain that I'm the third of my group, uh, which is the Center for Transportation Studies at the University of Missouri-St. Louis, to speak. Uh, I'm the only non-historian. Uh, my two colleagues, uh, Dr. Daniel Rust and Carlos Fuentes, have, speak, have spoken here, I think, several times, both, both of their books, and uh, really a good look at some of the early days of aviation, railroads, and traffic and history of the automobile in the United States. Uh, collectively between the two, I think, uh, even though Dan is just getting started, they have something like a dozen books, so they've done a great deal. Uh, I only have, uh, in the last period, uh, last couple of years, uh, the last couple of years, the only book I finished was one, but it did deal with the taxi cab industry called Taxi Urban Economics and the Social Impact. Uh, by the way, it's only five years old, it's completely out of date. Uh, we were talking about regulation and communities, both here and abroad, especially Great Britain. Uh, that was before Uber and Lyft came along. So I'm really going to say that doing the first chapter in the book and looking at what's happened now, I really wanted to go back and say, can we find from history any sort of cycle or links as to what may happen now that we have Uber and Lyft and this so-called disruptive technology that's coming about in this industry. So hopefully in the period of class time, 40, 45 minutes or less, I can carry you through that journey and make some implication as to what I think is going to happen in the future and where we are with this so-called disruptive technology. Uh, I do want to make a shameful plug, if you will, not bad, that I uh, do want to thank uh, really uh, Lance Tuhill, who was the uh, chancellor of our university for many years, she had this idea of establishing a center for transportation studies that wasn't just engineering or it wasn't just business, as most of them were, most of them are today, but we were unique with her idea that we should be a bridge transportation center that attempted to bridge contemporary and historical aspects as well as economic and business aspects together under one center. So we've been around for about 17 years, done a lot of research. We have a number of courses that uh, are being offered at the university today under the transportation banner, and so we feel quite good about it. As a matter of fact, even I introduced uh, Carlos and uh, Dan just a few minutes ago. Uh, I also wanted to say hello to my colleague Mike Edwards, who brought up for moral support. Mike is teaching with us in the transportation field and has just joined our faculty. Uh, but transportation is in his blood, by the way. His father was a transportation professor at uh, UM Columbia for a number of years. 
years. So he grew up uh, hearing about the ills and problems of transportation, and I suppose a few comments about academia from time to time also. But I think this idea is unique, and it's helped us in guiding us in developing this center for students and the courses that we teach. The title of the talk, though, Chariots, Horses, and Taxis, uh, really follows, and by the way, do I have any, I shouldn't say that, I should before I go there, do I have any taxi drivers here? I thought maybe we were drawing one or two, they're probably out trying to make a living, but to be honest with you, they're in probably the third or fourth oldest profession. I won't go into the first two oldest professions, but literally, wait, one of them's insurance, by the way, and the other is referring to, but we've had uh, chariots, wagons, for hire uh, since uh, the days of Mesopotamia, and that was about 3000 BC uh, when we first invented the wheel. Shortly after that, we domesticated the horse, uh, the chariot, or the wagon, and for hire began way back then. I'm not going all that far in my, pre in my presentation tonight. I'm simply going to try to cover briefly the uh, early regulation, the first taxis as they came online, really the jitney experience, uh, taxi wars in the 30s. I'm following that, that age-old principle of tell people what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then summarize it. So this is pretty much what we're going to cover tonight. The birth of water taxi regulations, um, our cycle of regulation, deregulation, and then re-regulation, and of course the impact that the birth of TNCs are having. I do have a theory, and it's the reason I was researching this, and that was the fact that we've seen this before. We've seen totally regulation of the sport carriage or higher industry way in the past, several different times, and it always resulted in re-regulation. So I wanted to see what were the common threads that basically led us to first say we have to deregulate this industry for our good, and then secondly, how long it took for us to re-regulate it because we felt we needed to in, in sake of public safety uh, and other reasons that I'll go into in a, in a few minutes. Okay, uh, really a fun part was really, I spent too much time by the way, uh, in both writing a paper that I had anyway to do, uh, but in preparing for this presentation, there are just a lot of different pictures about old Roman chariots, and they've been preserved over time. There are whole museums that are set aside for Roman chariots. These are the chariots that were kind of crude, and they were crude. No springs on these chariots. They were typically uh, pulled by two horses. Uh, surprisingly, the single horse chariot and so forth didn't come along for a long period of time. Uh, two horse chariot was primarily in the principal mode because they were heavy, they were hard to pull. Uh, one of the other interesting facts I read about these old Roman chariots was that women weren't allowed to drive them. Don't know why, I went to the background of it, but for some reason, for a couple hundred years, from about 300 BC to about 100 BC, the Romans decided women shouldn't be driving chariots. That changed, by the way. I don't know. Maybe the women got organized back in those days and they had a political rally and marched on uh, Rome's cap, or marched on Rome, but they changed it about 100 BC. And women were not only permitted in the chariots, but they also were permitted to ride in them. But really, I pick up the regulation back in Roman, I should say. Back in the Roman days, the first regulation came about. It wasn't too specific. It simply said, there's too much traffic on Roman streets. They're small, it's hard to get around in the daytime. People are getting run over. So we're gonna ban all chariots from daylight hours. The Romans divided the day up into 12 hour shifts, if you will, and you weren't allowed to drive your chariot, no matter how noble you were. Well, the high, high nobles were still allowed to drive their chariots because after all, they were important people. That's a little bit like today. But literally everybody else, wagons, people tendering things, come to the city. The city of Rome at that, that time was a, was a million people, so it's a very large area and spread out, but literally they wanted to get those chariots off for a variety of reasons, the streets and also the pollution that they caused. They wanted to get them off the streets, 
and let them be there only at night. As a matter of fact, today we have certain proposals by the research and public official to ban deliveries during the daytime due to congestion on our streets and only allow them at night. And they call it a new idea, literally surprising. But I picked this up in terms of regulation through the English, King Charles I, about 1635. Um, at that time, through the Dark Ages, there really weren't that many coaches outside wealthy families. You really didn't have too many people which were driving their own four hire coaches. A few people had them, but they weren't the kind of four hire situations where you had a stand, anybody could come, there was a set rate, and you could go someplace. Well, in London, the only way to get around was by water. As a matter of fact, Thames Waterman Gill had a monopoly. They were, in a sense, our first unions, and they were the ones that transported you. Coaches, as so many people got middle class, trying to earn more money, you had more people with coaches, you had inns that had people that wanted to go someplace, so they started to establish the first four hire coaches. And this is an idea that caught on really very rapidly. And very suddenly, the streets of London were crowded and shared with these coaches all over the place. Typically, these coaches were large vehicles, and they were drawn by two horses, sometimes four horses, and they were for people. They always had great horses for uh, moving goods around, but that's the first time that four hired. Innkeepers, shopkeepers, individuals that suddenly found themselves with a couple of hammers, i.e. horses, and a coach, they basically got into the business. There was no regulation to it whatsoever. The king decided that this is ridiculous. I can't move around. Everyone else can't move around. We're going to ban coaches from London. Well, Londoners apparently weren't afraid of losing their heads like some queens were. They basically decided to ignore the king. As I recall, gloriously ignored the king and the queen at that time and said, no, we're going to continue to do it. So the best way to do anything and get rid of it is to regulate it. And that's what King Charles did. He said, okay, we're only going to have 50 coaches. And they only can take you with, they, they can't move you for less than three miles. So we had our first regulatory scheme. Uh, there was a lot, of, a lot of discussion, and I read an awful lot about Queen Henrietta, which was his consort. I'm not sure what all that means, but I've got a pretty good idea. She was, and all the pictures of her, uh, she was extraordinarily, extraordinarily good looking. And the king did whatever she wanted. And she complained about her handmen that is her hand coach that carried her all around London, were always running into these coaches. So the king decided to bar them at first and then said only 50 could be there. The real reason that the history books that say this, that Henrietta was tired of running into all those coaches, they held up her, her footmen, so basically she wanted them banned. Queens were very powerful back then. This was a, a graphic representation about that time of Queen being hampered, being carried by her footmen. Uh, King Charles II came along very quickly and realized that these coaches were overrunning the streets of uh, London at that time. And they brought about very quickly the first ordinance to regulate these coaches uh, in 1662. Limited number of coaches, gave coaching qualifications, and vehicle coach specifications. And these were the forerunner of almost all regulations ground transportation taxes that came up to today. Uh, I've had the opportunity in my career, 20, 30 years now, I've, I've done the taxi cab studies, and I think I've done 30 or so around the country. And I often put this original idea, I've got a good solution and so forth, and how depreciation it is to read that somebody 400 years ago said the same thing and for the same reason, made the same recommendation, only for, this, only for the city of London or Paris or something else. They always follow the same sort of economic reason. Limit the number, have high standards, inspect the vehicles, inspect the drivers, vet them well, and match the amount of service to the demand. They were thinking that way 400 years ago. This was 
headed into about 200, 250 years, what I call the golden age of horses, coaches, and coachmen. It became a very professional job. As I said, the older coaches that were originally brought about 16, 16, 70, and so forth, uh, were quite fancy in many cases, uh, but they were slow. The odd point that I, that I found in my reading was the fact that they weren't used during good weather. Got a day way out there today? No problem. I can hit the coach. I can walk there faster. The coaches were slow. They were heavy. They were hauled by two horses. They literally couldn't make much time because they had to follow the streets wide enough for them. And you could footpath pretty much between the buildings and get there faster. That changed when we brought on the handsome cab. This was a cab that was lighter. It was pulled by one horse and developed the original truck. For the first time, Londoners could run around and they could go through more narrow streets, but they also had a horse that was capable of trotting for long distances at a time, well, two or three miles, I was thinking about that. And you had this very popular coach that pretty much spread throughout London very, very quickly and spread throughout Paris, a number of the major cities, and in the US you had this coach, uh, or variations of it, pretty much took over the industry. And, by the way, it's like I'm on women tonight, I didn't mean it to be this way, uh, there were coachmen and also coach women. There seemed to be no problem of men versus women back in the days of, uh, these days of choosing uh, uh, coachmen. It wasn't just the man's job, there were many women that also provided these services. Enter the automobile. And I should say, I was going to make this point, I don't know. Horses is in the title of this presentation, but there aren't much more about horses. I read a lot about them, and people, we, we think we have a love of the automobile. When you talk about the 1680s, 90s, 1700s, and people and their feelings for their horses, it was a little strange, but they really loved those horses just as much as we loved their automobile. And they treated them very, very well. I said I didn't have much about horses. I don't want to digress. That's my one problem about being an academic member and an educator. I am what's known as the academic disease. We love to hear ourselves talk. It's really tough to do online courses because in online courses, most of the students do the talking. They do a very well job, by the way. This generation doesn't want to listen to a prof talk for 45, 50 minutes, even no matter how much he likes himself. Literally, they want to be able to discuss things, and they discuss it very well online, and finding it out now later on in my teaching career. But my one instance of, uh, I'll give you a horse example, I won't digress too much. Uh, one city, San Antonio, said, were you doing a regulatory analysis for us? Uh, also do the regulations for horse-drawn carriage. Up until that time, that was 25 years ago, I had no idea that we had regulations for horse-drawn carriages also. Sure enough, entry, exit, how the vehicles are to be made, standards, even the horses and what the horses could do, size of horses and so forth, those regulations had existed from the 1650s and 1660s that are several hundred years old. So I took the top 10 cities in the United States and looked at their regulations for horse-drawn carriages. I use this example. Uh, I don't believe in reincarnation, but if I did, I would ask to come back as a horse providing horse-drawn carriage service in New York's Central Park. You cannot believe the bennies and goodies that these horses receive. They must have a union someplace because they've got a better set of requirements for how they're to be treated, how long they can work before they get a grain break, how much water they have to have each day, and how many people get nine weeks of pastoral recreation each year uh, for being in service uh, at least uh, nine months or ten months. I mean, it's a great, great contract. You know, where do you get such contracts? I'd love to have one today. But if, I'm, if I have to come back and reincarnate, I think it would be, be a horse working here. Enough about horses. Let's talk about the automobile. Uh, gas powered vehicles, chat or faster. Uh, they were cheaper, by the way. Uh, those horse burners, even if I should say that, the hay burners, even though people love them, they were basically expensive to keep and uh, literally keep up and so forth. And, and, and it was much cheaper to go to the gasoline automobile, 
right quickly after it was developed. The initial offering and the use of the automobile was for a public conveyance. Uh, the first taxi meter almost emerged immediately as we had our first cars in Germany in 1897. Uh, that was to keep the driver honest. It was also to make sure that the individual customer paid the correct amount. This, this form quickly replaced uh, coaches in, in, in the United, United States, Europe, all over the place. But in the United States, we had something like, and in London, between us, we had 1,200 carriage manufacturers in about 1875 or 1880. By the year 1915, maybe 20, 25 years later, we had maybe 90, 80 or 90. There was that much of a drop in people manufacturing uh, coaches. We just weren't needed anymore. Uh, one of the things that came about very quickly was that this new form of taxi, gasoline power, became an alternative to street railways coming. They were very popular. Just like Uber is popular today and rose very quickly, once we had a gasoline powered vehicle and the Model T Ford came about, they became very popular because one thing, they hated street railway companies. And, and typically at the peak time, the cars were crowded, they were hot, uh, and people, even though they enjoyed going from where they worked home, they literally were happy to see this alternative come about. Uh, this, by the way, is uh, one of the early 1897 meter German vehicles. This looks like a German vehicle, doesn't it? Really cool and tanks. Okay, some of the other pictures here uh, of early taxi cabs that came about very quickly from 1900 to 1910. Uh, we very quickly added thousands of these vehicles. They were very, very popular because they became an alternative for people to afford them to the street railway company. What happened very quickly as we, as we got more and more of these vehicles in the marketplace, uh, they flooded the marketplace and began to, began to compete with the street railway companies. Um, I had this picture right here. I forgot it. An interesting tidbit about New York and the first taxi cabs. And this is an example of the first nine came to this country, they were electric. Sort of interesting. We're working very hard to get back to electric vehicles, and we started out with them as our first taxi cabs. Uh, they had some problems, uh, but they were battery operated. Uh, and that's not, I haven't finished too much of the detail and so forth, but they didn't last very long. They were very quickly supplanted by gasoline vehicles. Uh, they were very supplanted by these vehicles, which became very popular in 1900 and 1910, uh, and Model T Ford then took over. The rise and fall of the jeep, very similar to what I uh, look at today in terms of when we look at Uber. Jitneys became very inexpensive because they were crowding the marketplace. Thousands of people took their Model T Ford and decided that if they were out of work, or even if they were in work, they may have quit work and started Jitney. It was called a jitney because it was known as the jitney nickel. These Model T Ford drivers were not going to be taxi cabs. They weren't going to have meters in their car. They weren't going to be regulated like taxi cabs. They were going to run and basically charge a nickel and go along the streetcar line and get in front of the streetcar line and pick up those passengers for a nickel, the same price as the streetcar line. Now we're not there yet with Uber and Lyft, but we're getting pretty close. We have Uber Pool and a few other things, and you have transit systems in the United States right now saying, oh, wait a minute, we're starting to lose ridership to these alternatives. And back in those days, the street railway company was slow, it was crowded, so if you spent the same amount of money to get into one of these jitneys, especially if you're lucky enough to get one of the seats inside the jitney, you had a more comfortable ride that you also quickly filled up and went directly to the city center where you wanted to go. They were the same price, but more comfortable and cheaper than the street railway companies. So they started to multiply as fast, and the only thing uh, that I've seen close to when the Uber has expanded 
were jitneys. Jitneys actually expanded faster than Uber's did, than, than Uber has, or the whole idea of transportation network companies, Uber led. Take them both together, jitneys grew much faster. There were 62,000 jitneys by, two, by 1915 in over 175 cities in this country, and they only started service in about 1914, that they became popular. So they had very rapid rise. The problem, though, um, and here some of the same sort of problems with Uber, they were dangerous. Uh, let's see. There's a picture of just how, how crowded jitneys were. This is about a period where they weren't, they weren't really probably about 1914, they had just started. Here's a picture of about 1915 or 16, where you see they had expanded the jitney, bought a P4, put another body on it, if you will, and became their own private tripway companies. And here you see people standing on the uh, standing on the street, on sideboards, I should say, on the jitneys. And you can imagine what happens in even a low impact crash. Vehicle stops, people know. They go in the, they get injured. A lot of deaths, a lot of injuries, and a lot of newspaper headlines calling for regulation of jitneys. Regulation of jet needs were also being pushed very much by the streetcar line owners. They were some of the most influential people in the community. They owned quite a bit of the real estate on the streetcar lines, and they found their revenues decreasing rapidly due to these jet needs. There was a lot of public and, I would say, private pressure, a lot of lobbying, as we call it today, which is legal, to regulate these jitneys and regulate them, they did. They basically required, in many cases, that the drivers be bonded, that they have insurance, and one of the ways to actually get less of something is to regulate it. Now, by 1917, remember started at 14, we're talking about 1917, the numbers were reduced from their height of about 90%. In the early 1920s, 2021, jitneys were completely gone. Now, is that going to be the same thing on uh, Uber? Do we see the cycle of overfunding a marketplace, people calling because it's dangerous, and literally, and regulating, in many cases, regulating it out of existence? Jitneys, um, as I said, regulated almost into obscurity. Uh, in the 20s, though, in the roaring 20s, not a great time to be alive, I think, especially if you enjoyed partying. Uh, the economy was booming. People were hard at work. Uh, taxi regulations were strengthened as a result of the Jitney experience. Taxis were strengthened more in terms of being specific as to the vehicle. The meter was calibrated. There were many more specifications given to taxi and taxi companies that how they were to operate. But they grew, and they grew at a rather steady pace along with the economy and growth in, in cities. By the 1920s, the latter part of it, there were about 84,000 taxi drivers, and it was considered to be a, a good job. It was considered to be like a, it was considered to be a better job than working in a factory um, all day long. And it was considered to be working as an employee of a well-established taxi company. They were the first in this period of time to add radios, which expanded greatly the ability of a taxi to come to your home. Prior to that, you had to send somebody to bring a taxi, or you had to make arrangements prior to that off a taxi stand to pick you up at a certain time during the day. The early radio dispatch systems were clumsy, and the taxi cabs were the first ones to be able to use them. And they helped them a great deal. They increased their productivity tremendously. And one of the things that we did with our employees back then as taxi companies, we started to share the extra revenue with them if they had take more trips per day. The quality of the taxi cab improved greatly. Um, this is one out of London, and I think it's probably in the 30s, uh, late, late 20s and 30s. But you can see some, from some of the earlier models, we really got uh, some very good looking cars out of regulation. Here's an example of the first radio dispatch taxi cabs, and I should say it was one of the very early ones. You can see 
a big mask on top and walk and uh, work in the old uh, tube the radios. Uh, but they did work. They had them actually before police cars. All came the Great Depression, and the Depression was one in where there's a lot of thing about taxi cabs, and that's why I asked drove for a taxi cab. If the industry is going really well, you find very few people looking to drive a taxi cab because they can get better jobs. If the industry is if industry is really poor, we go into a depression, like we've just had. People turn to any job they can find, especially if it's a cash job, and it was during the Depression, people turned out in large numbers to drive a cab. As I said earlier, in the late 20s, there were maybe uh, 50, 80,000 taxi drivers. Very quickly, by 1932, there were 150,000 cab drivers. We doubled the number of drivers. We had a glut in the marketplace. Taxi garages that used to be companies now we're able to buy the oversupply of auto output for probably less than the cost of your make. And they put these cars out, these excess cars out to anybody who wanted to drive for a couple dollars a day. So you had taxi companies that were involved in all the risks. They had the car, they did everything with the driver, it was an employee, and suddenly they shifted the risk to the driver and leased them the car. That is, they made their money off leasing the cars, not necessarily how much money that driver took in. And I really think that changed quite a bit the complexity and somewhat the orientation of many of our taxi garages and taxi companies. But we had such an oversupply and during the Depression, prices sank, shrank from 70 cents a mile, which would be in today's terms about 250 or 270, to 40 cents, to even 15 cents, which would be about a dollar or less per mile in today's terms. Fierce competition resulted in what's known as the taxi wars of the 1930s. I'm sure some of you may be aware that the taxi wars got to be so fierce that in New York City, each borough had its own gang, which was the taxi company. And you would take a cab in that borough to the borough boundary. And from that borough boundary, you'd get into another cab because another gang literally for some of the early gangs in New York, were taxi companies, taxi gangs, if you will. Um, you hear show a picture of a gang that uh, upended uh, somebody else's taxi cab. Um, these were literally wars, both in the U.S. and in Canada. Now, I wish you wish uh, I couldn't get it to run. There's a 1932 film by uh, everybody's favorite uh, actor at the time, James Cagney, and if you enjoyed uh, watching Loretta Young get slapped around, they were too uh, oriented towards some of the PC things today. Uh, it's actually a story about a love story between those two, but in between, he's a taxi driver. And he's one of the taxi drivers that is not affiliated with the company. He is a rogue taxi driver. Has great scenes of taxis, these old taxis pushing each other off the highway, people getting in fights. Uh, it really did highlight the whole idea of oversupply and resulting taxi wars and also some of the price problems they had. Calls for greater regulation once more in New York developed what was known as the Hatch Act of 1937, which took the same standards. They didn't realize that at the time, I didn't either. It took the same standards that King Charles II had in 1635 and literally applied them in New York City. Because the medallions for the first time were, were permitted New York City. And by the way, King Charles II had medallions for the cab, for the coaches that they, uh, they, they basically licensed. So the whole idea of a New York City medallion cab didn't come about originally with them. It was really developed several hundred years before that. But vehicle standards were set, driver qualifications were set, for the first time they required insurance of everybody, and they had a fixed price. No longer could you vary the price depending on time of day or the evening or if you didn't like the person that got in or didn't like them. It had to be set in standard taxi meters were now monitored and literally set uh, so that everyone was on the same page, if you will. Profit was limited. And it developed what's known, and I've watched on this in other places, uh, called the Taxi and Income Regulatory Pact. What a regulatory pact does is say, okay, we think regulation is necessary for public safety and public interest. 
what the regulatory act says, if you, the regulated company, give up the opportunity to earn greater profit. But if you, the regulated company, agree to the limited number of vehicles on the streets, abide by our operating rules, hire only our drivers we license, and then we'll protect you from ruinous competition. That's the regulatory act. And I'm a conservative right now to my wingtips. I don't like regulations, but there are some industries that if they're not regulated, they degenerate into chaos. Customers can take advantage of them. And literally, you do have, after a period of time, cause for regulation. If you're trying to get into this industry, the tax industry, in the 1940s, and really up until about the 70s, literally, you had to prove and to break this regulatory contract. You had to prove that the taxi company providing the service, if you wanted to be a newcomer and come into the industry, you had to say, we have identified an unmet demand. And you do that with a lot of letters from hotels and other travel agencies saying, oh, we need taxi service and so forth. But you also had to prove that the existing taxi company wouldn't provide service. Now, that's what's known as a high bar, very high bar. And very few people were able to break into the taxi industry because of this regulatory compact. The regulatory agency is saying, we'll protect you from ruinous competition. One of the things it did do, a positive aspect, is it stabilized the industry. Okay? You can see under those conditions why it might. The downside is that in a regulated industry that we have here, in a regulated industry, innovation really doesn't come about too easily. There's no incentive for the company to really put a lot of money into technology and new things. Sure, you go along with generally what's happening, but you don't disrupt what you're doing because, after all, your rates are regulated, your profits are regulated, things are fine, you're going on just fine. And in many cases, regulated industries fall into what's known as more service, better ways of doing it come about, and finally this builds up to where there's a dam of uh, demand otherwise. I uh, had a couple slides here what the taxi, taxi industry looked like during this period of high degree of regulation. Fondness, some of you, I don't know, not too many of you might remember cars that looked like this. I don't want to embarrass everybody. I remember these kinds of cabs when they first came out, well, when they were around. Uh, the old checkered cabs developed by the Martin family in, uh, in Chicago and met New York and Dallas. Uh, I just had a few slides here to show you the impact today, though, under this regulatory framework. Uh, by the way, there's the New York cab in the future. A new cab was introduced last year, and New York City is saying all cabs have to have this capability, this kind of a vehicle, uh, as they move forward. New York is the only city, by the way, that requires cabs to be four years or less old, and so they change out probably 3,000 cabs for the industry each year. It's the only city that does that. 80% of the drivers in New York and in many of our larger cities are foreign born. And that's not unusual. The Irish were the drivers of the, uh, of the uh, late 30s, 40s, uh, the Italians in some cities. <coughs> Pretty much these were exceptional jobs, good jobs. Today, some of the immigrants were part of the Pretty well covered that the poor service resulted in many cases because of regulation which stabilized the industry, but over a period of time actually led to some poor services of the industry. The reasons for the poor service, and I've hinted about it, and I've written in other places about it, uh, the industry shifted risk of company, which literally had a Smith and Wealth Foundation just talking about company orientation. They shifted that to the driver. The risk of the car, the risk of making a profit, the risk for paying the expenses, all were pretty well shifted from what we know as a full service cab company to in many cases just the driver. So the driver looks at their economic future one trip at a time. That is, they gotta make as much money as they can from each trip. A 
company will look at its overall image and how much money they're making over a quarter over a period of time. They're taking Adam Smith's long run view of the marketplace. People forget that an individual owner operator taxi driver is interested in how much money they have to make that day to pay the lease rate, and then they start to make any money for themselves. Not all. You have some very sharp cab drivers out there. One of the things I've been doing studies, I've tried to suggest to people, there's no, no such thing as the average income for a cab driver. I've seen in cities that with the same lease rate that they're paying, I've seen people that go to the airport, sit there three or four hours with their buddies, playing dominoes, checks, bars, whatever, uh, they can't, religion doesn't allow them to drink, so they're not going to uh, go to a local bar joint. Uh, they literally uh, go on the city to coffee all day, their wife wants them to do something that is productive, so they go to the airport, sit in the cab line for three or four hours, and maybe get three or four trips a day. Income, nine, ten, fifteen thousand. I've seen the same company with the same set, the same set of licenses, the same sort of fees, and drivers that literally work their permits. They drive six, seven days a week, maybe 10, 12 hours a day, and they take home after, after paying their expenses. Driving your cab, 60, 70, I've seen this high. I think we had one driver in, in Denver that uh, actually had reported income up to $90,000 after expenses. Why is that? People work their cab license differently. So when people say you can't make a living make you're not driving your cab, it all depends how you want to work that permit. Uh, higher medallion values is another reason for poor service. Medallions work well for one generation of drivers. That is, if you drive in your medallion, it's going to be your retirement. If everything goes right, you may end up with $100,000 or more in the medallion. The only problem is that drivers, how do they get $100,000? The driver gets $15,000, $20,000, $30,000, that may be a house as far as they're concerned. They're going to sell that medallion if you have a secondary marketplace for those medallions. In New York City, the medallion value got up to million uh, for at one time. But, as we'll show you here, and, and somebody has to pay for that medallion. And that medallion cost, amortization cost, that is built, built into the actual taxi figure. Movement to the suburbs, two car families, less, in, less use of taxi cabs has also made that industry really a problem. Along comes ride sharing. It says, I'm not going to deregulate it because I'm basically a technology company, not a transportation company, and I'm not going to have the cost of a taxi company. I'm not going to buy insurance. Uh, I'm going to use people's personal cars. The only thing they bring is a cell phone. I'm going to bet them, and this wonderful app I have is going to allow us to capture a large part of the marketplace. And oh, by the way, I'm going to subsidize about a half to two-thirds of the cost of this entire operation through venture capital money. And we have a framework and business strategy of Uber. Uber becomes, with an app, America's private car. People love it. They really do. They have sort of, don't like the taxi cab. Here's Uber. Driven by a personal individual. Cars clean. It's cheaper. In many cases, it's a half, especially if you're not in surge or gouge time. Literally, it is just loved by consumers. The problem is it's being subsidized, highly subsidized. What's going to happen after the subsidy goes away? This is not an Amazon-type company where every quarter you found their losses getting closer and closer to their revenues, if you will. And you can see at some period of time, those lines are going to cross, and it's going to be profitable. Amazon's crossed the lines, but it's not, it's not making a lot of money. Uber's not like that. They run to that far apart and they're standing far apart. About $800 million per quarter. They're spending on your ride. How long is that going to last? I figure two to three years to get sense. About the money, the venture capital money that uh, Uber has left. So why is there a problem? In many cases, it's illegal. It's illegal, by the way, to get an Uber X car in the city of St. Louis. 
We have statewide regulation. The regulatory commission here, the tax and leasing company, the commission has no other alternative than to enforce these laws and regulations. And the regulations say you must be regulated as a taxi company if you're going to provide this kind of commercial or higher transportation. So why is it? Uber drivers giving tickets? Well, the camera's running here, so I'm trying to be polite as I possibly can to all the political entities involved. We have a political official, i.e. the mayor, that says we're not going to enforce that law. We have a situation where, I don't know, is St. Louis a sanctuary city? Maybe we have other laws that we're not going to enforce. But we simply said we're not going to enforce that law. Mainly, politically popular to do that. Same thing for sanctions. It's politically popular to say we're not going to enforce that law because people love this service. So that's where we are in many cities across the country where it hasn't yet been made legal, although they're pretty well going to state levels and getting laws changed so that they are legal. Um, but we have many cases for them to exist for a while and to put the other way. Now let me just run through the last few slides. I'm taking the amount of time that I told you in the act I was about to talk. Uh, I'll just show you some slides here about Lyft in New York. You see the kind of rapid pace once this came about. Very much like Jitney's. It just grew leaps and bounds. You have a situation where you see Uber's rapid growth here from July, January 15th, 250,000 uh, bookings uh, up to well over a million. And that was in a year. One year. Just tremendous growth. As I said, we've seen this movie before. What Uber has done to get an increase this more is to say, okay, we're going to take our old rates and we're going to lower them at least a dollar or two below taxi rates. We're going to increase it. Now, say to yourself, that's really good, isn't it? Consumer really benefits. Well, maybe in the long run. But the short run, the drivers are the ones that get hurt. The legal problems I want to finish here, uh, Uber has a lot of legal problems today. Uh, any one of them could completely disrupt your business model and force them out of business. Um, are their drivers employees or are they independent contractors? Well, I've testified in several different uh, California courts and arbitration cases with taxi cabs and shared by bank services as to whether they're an employee or an independent contractor. And trust me, it's awfully difficult to prove that you are an independent contractor. You really have to make sure and organize your relationship with your drivers and not have any control elements over those drivers at all. If you are exercising control, it better be controlled by an ordinance or an airport agreement or something like that, where it's not your control, it's the control of the city or the airport or the state. Uber has none of that. They have no such exemption from those kinds of issues. And they're losing their independent contractor issues. Their latest point last year or two has been to say, okay, every driver has to sign an arbitration agreement that we won't have any class actions against us anymore because we're losing too much money. They lost at least 100 million in one case, and the judge said that's not enough. Compensation to go back to court and get, get drivers more money. So I guess if you're losing 800 million a year, a million dollar loss, a hundred million dollar lawsuit, it's gonna hurt you more, it's gonna hurt you. That's what you're trying to do. But you start having more of those. So they decide all well, the drivers have to be have to sign arbitration agreements. Well, the California courts being what they are, they said, wait a minute, they were signed under this arrest. We may not literally approve of those arbitration agreements, and we may say we may allow a collective bargaining, uh, we may allow a class action loss. Actually, the California courts, because we're not our our plaintiff lawyers dream, if you will, and they are creating this. Unionization, Seattle has said to their Uber drivers, you can unionize. Uh, illegal advertising, they've lost different $25, $30 million claims. The city saying you falsely misled drivers that you could make $90,000 a year driving an Uber car. No, no one would work. Okay. Right now, they've got some sexual harassment in the workplace, uh, certain uh, 
lawsuits against them for that, um, spying on customers. They have the software that basically follows you after you get out of the car. Not only where you got out of the car, but where you went after you got out of the car. So they wanted to advertise that as a Uber database for marketing purposes so they could market that to people that wanted to know what retail shops, where were people going. other than the CIA. Literally, spying on a customer, they also have a software package called Grayball. This just came out last week. Has anyone heard of Grayball software by Uber? Okay. Uber software is, is for the rest of you, they, it's they basically very good technicians. They decided that since they were illegal in many cities and airports, getting tickets, they were paying the tickets for the drivers, that's the Democrats. They told the drivers, break the law, it's just something I trust them to do, break the law, and we'll pay all your tickets. But they didn't like paying all those tickets. A friend of mine runs the uh, regulatory and airport system in Salt Lake City, and he was finding them up to $4,500 per vehicle and per driver. It was a $9,000 ticket. He said, hey, that's great, let's just keep going, guys. They developed the software that knows that it's a regulatory person, cell phone, that's trying to ping to find out where Uber drivers are. If that cell phone were to actually get a group an Uber driver to come to him, they would they would phone that Uber driver and say, cancel it right away. That's a regulatory official. They're trying to trap you into one of these tickets. Is that illegal? I don't know, but it certainly is nefarious, if you will. Uh, I have labeled Uber, I hate to pick on them, no, they, they don't hate to pick on them, but I have labeled them as a, shall we say, ethically challenged company. They've accused them of being anything illegal outside of court, uh, but I really think ethically, that's a terrible company. Um, you know, if I'm, I did do this to some whether or not Uber should be allowed to operate. And I asked the woman that was on the review committee, uh, how do you feel about approving a company that has multiple sexual harassment charges against it? So what does anything to do with this? This has everything in the world to do with it. You know, you're a government official. And you're on, you basically are applying minimum standards to the ethics of, of this particular company. Uh, Okay, uh, current financial problems, I won't go into it other than to uh, say that uh, if you're a driver, if you go through this business model, you invest in making $5 an hour. In some of the cities, we have found that they're making as little as $2.50 a month. So why do they do it? They have 100% turnover rate every six months of the drivers. And other people find out, hey, I'm really in danger of myself, my car, uh, my liabilities there. No, I'm not making any money, so I'm, I'm just not going to do it. Others, hey, think it's a large, it's a nice thing to do. I've got nothing else to do. I got a car. I want to meet people. It's a way to go out and do that. It's called part of what we call it. We'll call it the economy. So let me summarize by saying, why do we regulate in the first place? Ever since the Roman days and King Charles and New York City and everybody in between, we regulate because the public demands it for public safety. And to make sure that people get a fair deal. They're not taking advantage of it. Unscrupulous operators out there. There are many other examples of where this happened where we don't have regulation. Okay? The regulatory compact, as I said, it's good because it adds stabilization, but it's bad because it really is not very good for innovation and change. Why do we be regulating taxes? Because we come along and economists say, hey, if we deregulate, we'll have better competition, we literally will eliminate all this. Uh, inefficiency and so forth, and every time it doesn't work out that way. And economists can't figure out why. I'll tell you why. Because the economists that are telling you that only read the cliff notes of that as this wealth of all nations. But thinking about the companies here. And when you get deregulation, a lot of people running around just looking at how much money they're making the next trip, they're thinking about just that day. 
they don't have the kind of economic competitive effects that economists think they're trying to do. And I'm obviously not an economist. So the question is, will app and technology improve or will it have the right channel? Uh, whenever they're forced to make actual profit, will that change? We have finally, will we have finally broken the cycle of regulation, deregulation, pre-regulation, well, we have broken the cycle with technology and the use of information um, data systems. I don't know. But you know, when I read my articles about Uber drivers and not even paid Uber drivers, there's one, one guy who was selling the Uber stickers to go in cars so the guys could go around bars at night and pull up and say, oh, I can take you just with the Uber sticker. I'll take you. I'm, I'm only in cash tonight. And it's surcharge time. Try to give you four times. And the driver's not vetted. We have people coming up to airports, and after they take a personal one, it's a bunch of points, they say, Look, I'll, I'll take you as a personal. We'll take you off the Uber. Taxi drivers do this all the time. They don't try to be your office. They're basically taking you as a personal. Nothing wrong with you. If you're in a taxi cab, you got 24 7, 365 days a year regulatory insurance. You're covered. When that Uber driver, turns off that Uber app and picks you up personally, you have no coverage whatsoever. You're not covered by Uber, you're not covered by personal insurance because it does not have a ride-sharing driver in their contract. So if you have an accident, the driver, you, anybody else, no liability, no comprehension. You know, whoever owns that vehicle, by the way, that's mom and dad that owns that vehicle, say goodbye to the house because it's gone if you cause the accident. I hate to be overstating it, but I don't think I am. I honestly think you are in really engaged in yourself. So with those kinds of issues and those kinds of now, the insurance that Uber had, dropped out secondary insurance, literally has not been proven yet. It takes four or five years to really find out whether insurance is good or not. I helped develop an insurance program in the transportation industry, and it was an offshore insurance company. I must admit, I learned more about treaties and leases and everything else dealing with insurance, and they made the lawyers look like the required ones. I mean, this is a really backdoor business, in most cases, the insurance industry. And you want to find out in four or five years whether or not the change of the policy that these and these transportation companies had is really going to be worth it. Right now, they're not letting anything into court. What they're doing is paying off the large payments first before they went against it. Obviously, the history of chariots, taxis, Ubers is yet to be written. I tell my operating friends and members in the industry, this is an omelet. Myself, as an academic, I'm the chicken. I'm laying a few eggs from time to time. Uh, everyone else loves Uber, and I'm saying, well, wait a minute, let's be a little careful. But my operating members in this uh, omelet, uh, they're pigs. It's their bacon, and they're getting fried. 20, 30 percent losses in volume and revenue. A lot of them are doing these seats. A lot of major companies are looking at it. They seem to very lean times, if not bankruptcy. So we'll see what happens. In the next two or three years, we'll see whether that continues or not. I ran over my time. I told you, I know he's not here to sell stock, and I apologize for that. Uh, any questions? Just look like class. Yes.
are setting the rates. They are setting rates across competing companies. And that's an antitrust violation. So they're arguing that. Um, it, it's, a, it's a race. Right now they call it a race to either the autonomous driving vehicle, which they think is sort of safe, so, uh, or an idea. They can't do an IPO. Not what the lawsuits say. Not what the problems that they have in their cases. Most, uh, most financial papers right now say if somebody offers you a piece of paper, run the other way. Do not invest in it.